Welcome. Everything is fine. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week, we welcome our special guest, Lonnie Diane Rich. She is the New York Times bestselling author of Funny Women's Fiction and the owner of Chipperish Media, where she podcasts about Buffy, The West Wing, writing, and more. Hi, Lonnie. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I love this show. We're so excited to have you on. Oh, I'm so excited. I would not have ever watched The Good Place if it hadn't been for you guys. And I'm so grateful because I love that show. And I love your podcast. I think it's fantastic. You guys do a wonderful job. Oh, uh, thank you. That means a lot. <laughs> really? You started watching the show because of us? I thought oh, yeah. maybe you had watched it before. No, it wasn't even on my radar, you know, and then you guys kept talking about it because I don't have regular television. I cut the cord. So basically, I watch streaming stuff and I don't watch stuff when it actually airs. I wait until, you know, I hear a buzz about it and I go to Mm -hmm. it later when it's on like Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, you guys kept talking about this um, and mentioning The Good Place. And I love Kristen Bell. So it always got my attention because I've adored her since Veronica Mars. Um, And then eventually one day I was like, okay, they're talking about this. It sounds really cool. I got to sit down and watch it so i watched the first episode and then i watched all of the episodes like in one (laughs) run and then i went back and watched it again and i kid you not my daughters and i have watched the whole run of this show like seven times wow that might be more than us it It might be they love it i mean every time i come into the living room they're downstairs watching the good place it's it's really (laughs) cool awesome it does have a lot of replayability it really does because all those little details that kind of dovetail in and things that you don't notice on the first watch or the second watch or like, you know, the eighth watch, you'll pick up on the ninth, you know, and there's still <laughs> new stuff to find there. It's amazing. I'm hoping season two will be just like the same thing. <laughs> I think it will. I think season two is going to be really interesting. And I don't know. I have some theories about that. So we'll see where that goes. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'll get us started. This week, we are looking at Season 1, Episode 13, Michael's Gambit. It was written and directed by Michael Schur and aired on January 19th, 2016. And this was the second part of the two-part finale. Which we discussed last week with our episode, The Truest Person. Mm -hmm. We got a little bit of feedback on that episode, actually. Someone Mm -hmm. mentioned that they don't think that Mindy St. Clair is really that bad of a person. And it's probably equal to Eleanor on Earth. Okay. I disagree. (laughs) I don't know. I think she may be like, um, she may be Eleanor had Eleanor not changed. You know, had Eleanor not uh, evolved. I can see some similarities between Mindy St. Clair and Eleanor from the flashbacks. But we're seeing Eleanor growing and changing. And I think that's kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and Mindy's never been forced to change, so. Mm-hmm. We open on a bustling office where Michael receives his promotion and the chance to design a neighborhood. We cut to Michael's face as we pan out and see Sean task Jason, Eleanor, Chidi, and Tahani with choosing the two to go to the bad place. Michael apologizes to the group for his mistakes. So we're getting to see Michael's workplace. We're yeah, getting we a, Michael a Michael flashback. flashback. This is so cool. Yeah. It is. It's kind of crazy because we haven't really seen anything from his POV yet. I mean, I don't think we've seen anything from his POV no. yet, have we? No, no, we haven't. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. It opens up this whole extra story space that we haven't been able to look at yet and that probably we haven't even noticed was missing. And then suddenly there it is. Yeah, we're getting a lot more of the world building. Like before we, we've we been talking about the bad place and the possibility of a medium place. And then we see people from the bad place and then we see the medium place. So the world just keeps Mm -hmm. growing. And now we see Michael's workplace outside of these heaven and hell constructs. Mm -hmm. We get the birth of this good place, right? Like Mm -hmm. Michael getting the idea of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. It's pretty cool. What did you think of the setting? Like the look of everything? I thought it was really neat. You know, I mean, it's this like gray workplace, you know, but it's it's less gray and more steely. You know, there's just this sense to it. It feels very hard. All the surfaces feel very hard. Um, I, I just thought it was a really interesting visual aesthetic. And one of the things that they do really well on The Good Place is that sense of the visual. And the visual is a representation of the emotional landscape that you're in, you know, and I, I find that really fascinating the way that they do that. It looked like a bank to me. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> like yeah, a bunch of it was a bank. <laughs> old bankers at their, or personally, it reminded me of 
those shots from the war movies with all the the women typing at the typewriters, the the secretarial pool, exactly, mm-hmm. where your husband has mm-hmm. uh, died or your son has been killed, whatever. But everyone just doing their own thing in rows and rows mm-hmm. of people. It felt cold. Yes, yeah. it did. And I noticed that Michael had a plaque on his desk that reads, "You don't have to be immortal to work here, but it sure helps." <laughs> Which is cute. <laughs> I just love that prop masters add stuff like that. It's so great. Yeah, just little things like having coffee pots and just they're normal people going about their job. Yeah. They've got little mm-hmm. posters on their walls. They've got little plaques. They've got, you know, they wake up and put their pants on one leg at a time like everybody else. <laughs> All right, we'll continue. Eleanor begins deliberations, arguing that she and Jason should go to the bad place. Jason argues the consequentialist view that all of them are bad because their actions had negative results. Eleanor convinces Jason to go, while Tahani pressures Chidi to discuss his romantic feelings. Oh, Tahani. (laughs) Wait a minute. Jason all of a sudden is paying attention? This is blowing my mind. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, what? You suddenly remember it just so you can save your own ass? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, Jason's intelligence is variable um, mm-hmm. because most of the time, you know, he's a big donut, you know, um, and then we get these moments where he he can pull out, you know, like a, a complicated idea. And I always find that really weird. And I'm never sure if it is essentially like inconsistent because Nothing else that they do here is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like that in that time where, you know, she was getting the notes and then she goes and she sees him, you know, and meets him in the street, you know, and he seems like he understands everything. And then all of a sudden he's Jason again. So it feels to me like there's something weird going on with Jason. And since everything in this story is so deliberate, I don't know. I feel like there's going to be some kind of, I feel like something's going to happen with that in season two where we find out that Jason is not what we think he is either. That maybe he's a spy from like another, you know, warring building, like, you know, a, a competing bank of architects oh, <laughs> from Michael's. Oh, really I don't know. I don't know. But the thing is that Jason is inconsistent and nothing in this show is inconsistent. Exactly. Hmm. So, so that's the kind of thing that makes me think something's up with Jason, but I have no idea. I mean, it could just be that they just really couldn't resist going for the joke, you know, of this guy talking about consequentialism, mm-hmm. which is fun. Yeah. I and mean, it's fun in the moment, but character wise, it's inconsistent. And in ordinarily in any other show, I would be like, oh, well, they just, they just decided to go for the joke because they have no discipline, but there is not a writing team, I think, in the history of storytelling that has more discipline than this team. Yeah, I really want to believe that it's not just, we need somebody to say this line, so let's just throw it in Jason's mouth. Right, right, you know, and it's because it's funny. I mean, it really is funny. It's a great joke, and it's fun to see him say that, and especially when Chidi gets so upset afterward. He's like, now you understand (laughs) things, Mm -hmm. you know? And he's still saying ethnically. Exactly. I know. And that's the thing. Like, it's inconsistent even within the moment. He switches back and forth between almost these two personalities. So I'm, I'm really interested to see if we find out, you know, later on in season two that there's something more complicated and more interesting happening with Jason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've never really thought about the idea of Jason kind of exaggerating his stupidity before but now that's all i can think about like maybe he's trying to make himself seem dumber to get some kind of sympathy perhaps right although in his flashbacks he's pretty dumb stupid oh yeah he was he was a box of rocks you know i mean really so um so i don't i don't know what could possibly explain it but i am my expectations are so high from the rest of this show that in a situation where i would ordinarily just decide that the writers just went for the joke because they couldn't help themselves i i don't know these writers are very very disciplined so i don't know Mm mm-hmm Jason, more behind the curtain. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) So, Lonnie, I wanted to ask you, because Jason and I have been discussing this whole season about who we ship. Yes. And I'm definitely an Eleanor and Chidi shipper, and Jason is like a casual... Yeah, casual to honey cheaty shipper. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to know, do you ship anyone on the show? 
Oh, God. I always ship. I always <laughs> ship. And I, I, I'm definitely Eleanor and Cheedy. Oh, uh, yeah. Know, absolutely Eleanor and Cheedy. <laughs> but I have to say, I have a bigger ship than that. Oh. And it's not a romantic ship. But it's it's this love story, like the true love story here, like the true love story in the West Wing, wing is about uh, Leo and the president. Mm-hmm. And I think that the true love story here is Eleanor Tahini or Tahani. I always call it the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> it's, she's not a sauce. It's, it's Tahani. Like, I'm you're sorry. like her parents. It's okay. You she's, get her- <laughs> she's saucy. <laughs> she is saucy. She is saucy. She's a Greek yogurt sauce, and I like it. Um, no, Eleanor and Tahani are my actual real ship. That is the real love story, and I'm not talking about a romantic relationship, but there is something in the way that these two connect with each other, and and I think you know when. You know, when Eleanor was putting the the crazy cheap blonde extensions into Ani's hair, mm-hmm. it was such like a tender and and lovely moment. And I think that the, the while the romantic ship for me is Eleanor and Chidi, absolutely, I think the real core love story of the Good Place is Tahani and Eleanor. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, they're both very broken in different ways. Mm-hmm. Tahani is such a product of her parents and her sister and Eleanor oh, is yeah. as well. She's a product of her parents. I don't know. It just seems like they're maybe they can both use each other to better themselves. Like help fix each other. Yeah, they can fix okay. each other. I think maybe heal each other yes. is more what yes. we're looking that's, for. That's, right? that's definitely that, that, it. Mm-hmm. They're so different, you know, and the thing is, is that Tahani's issues come from this essential insecurity, which she constantly has to disprove. And Eleanor's problems come from, you know, no insecurity at all about herself, um, but rather just... Oh, yeah, she knows she's hot. Ex- well, she knows she's <laughs> smart. She knows she's capable, you know, and she's not interested in getting in a situation where she needs to depend on anybody. Like, mm-hmm. I think for, for Eleanor, her, her issue comes from... Loving people means that they will hurt you. Caring about people means that they will hurt you. And even when she has that moment with Chidi, you know, earlier in the season where she says, I love you, she almost immediately Mm -hmm. pulls back from that and decides, no, no, I don't love you. You know, it's just a friendship thing. It's just a student teacher thing. That's all it is, you know, Um, because I think that once she gets to the point where she's she's realizing she genuinely cares for somebody, that it becomes too vulnerable for her. It's just too much vulnerability and she can't Mm -hmm. have that. So, so I find it interesting because, you know, Tahani is essentially insecure and Eleanor is essentially afraid. And I think that the way that they can, they can help and heal each other could be some really interesting opportunities for, for that best friend love mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how they're going to do that in season two when they're all separated, like how long it's going to take for them to get to know each other again and form those friendships. Oh, season two is going to be really interesting. Yeah, I think that they're going to surprise us. They always surprise us. I think they're going to do some really smart things and surprise us. Absolutely. As as much as we can predict, mm-hmm. I don't think we're any of us is going to be right. Yeah, I know. Like, I'm hoping that they're mm-hmm. just going to flip everybody on their heads and completely come out of left field. Oh, yeah. And do something totally different. I think it's that they are. I actually I have a theory about that. It's going to be really interesting to see how that comes out. <laughs> So all season long, we've been talking about Janet's personhood. And Tahani says to Jason, by the way, Janet is not your wife or your soulmate. There's a Janet in every neighborhood. And we didn't really take into account individualism Mm -hmm. in our evaluation of Janet's personhood. But what are your thoughts on her personhood? Do you agree with us that she's kind of not really a person at this point? (laughs) Oh, God, you know what? It's it's really a complicated question. And I love how complicated that question is. I think as soon as she starts um, expressing her own autonomy, you know, when she steals the train and leaves, she's talking about I want not you're asking me to do this. Mm-hmm. Right. It's her autonomy. And I think that as she expresses desires and autonomy, that she becomes a person. So I, I mean, my favorite thing, one of my favorite things in this is that whenever anybody defines her, whenever anybody tells her what she is, she immediately slaps it down. Not a robot, not a girl, you know, mm-hmm. not a person. Mm-hmm. Like she does that. She doesn't ever say what she is, but she will, she will define herself. Like when people try to define her, she says, I'm not that thing. So I find it really interesting that she is slowly defining herself 
through the exclusion of the things that she is not. She's, you know, not a, not a person, not a robot, not a girl, you know, uh, but she is a mm-hmm. wife. I mean, she is actually claiming her own identity. So when you look at, at Janet from the sense of individual identity, because you look at bad Janet and bad Janet is different from good Janet. They're yeah, she's very different. one note. They're entirely different, you know, and uh, the performance is beautiful for both of them, you know. Um, but uh, but they're they're very different people and very different entities and with different experiences. So I think that while there are multiple Janets, the very specific, you know, serial number that is probably stamped to her her ass, I would imagine, um, is different. <laughs> you know, she is different and she is expressing autonomy. And I think that when she expresses desires and autonomy, she does, for me, become a person. Okay. Interesting. I agree with most of what you've said. <laughs> um, I don't agree that because she even uh, about being a wife, because mm-hmm. she even said the ceremony was not legal (laughs) at all um but i do believe that she's on her way to becoming what we defined as a person Mm -hmm. um and her growth is what intrigues me the most yeah because of all these things that she's been doing or saying i want this i want that i'm doing this and Mm -hmm. it's so much more than just i am your robot servant basically Right, because the robot servant gives them what they want. It's all about what they want. You know, Mm -hmm. she serves others and that's her role. But when she starts making choices, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to be here. You know, I want to be married to Jason. And even though that, that marriage may not be legal, I think it is an emotional marriage it is the, correct the, you're right by yeah. me by the power vested in me i pronounce this man and wife that's the time <laughs> that she pronounces herself something she gives herself an identity and yeah. i think that that is showing her showing her autonomy and agency and once you have the ability to desire something for yourself um i think that that is you know that is a person she has feelings she has desires she has wants and that mm-hmm. to me, you know, that to me ticks her over the edge. That makes her a person, regardless of whether or not it's all wires and, and whatnot and electronics yeah. under the under the chest. When she can want something for herself and when she can take agency to procure that thing for herself, then she becomes a person. Wow. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I just want to say here that Tahani hasn't witnessed a lot of Janet's growth. Mm-hmm. So at this point, I think... Her point of view is that she's like a robot wife to yes. Jason. Yes. So we as viewers are coming from a different position. We have seen all of Janet's growth. We know that she has desired things and she's made the effort to ha- make those things happen. So we're able to see her as more well-rounded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tahani has not been witness to all these actions. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty close to calling her a person right now. <laughs> Yeah. Have I, I pulled you yeah. over to my side, Viv? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I Yeah, I'm getting pretty close. <laughs> All right, so shall we move on? Mm-hmm. Jason and Eleanor say their goodbyes, but they are interrupted by the real Eleanor. She says she will take one of their places, and so the deliberation begins anew. Sean blames Michael for this situation. We flash back to Michael starting the blueprint for his neighborhood, hoping to try something new. The foursome take turns offering themselves up to go to the bad place. This is my favorite part after watching the show through because Mm -hmm. seeing Michael making his plans and writing a bold new plan for the good place and the fact that the good place is in quotations is so perfect to me. Yeah, I didn't notice that. Because it's obviously it's not the good place, it's the bad place, but the quotes just make it so much better. And oh, if yeah. you're just watching it the first time, you don't really think anything about it. It's like, oh, this is the good place and it's <laughs> going to be a bold new plan. Great. Yes. Yeah. And you assume that the bold new plan is going to be him staying in the good place. Yeah. Right. But even that little detail, I mean, I, I love, I love this thing because we have those quotes around the good place, right? Which means that we are playing fair with the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody is deliberately doing anything to mislead the audience. All of the details, when you watch this through again, after having seen the whole thing, they all line up and you look at it and you go, they did that. Yeah. We're not being lied to. And that's so important. 
Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely, it's the best example of playing fair with the audience. There are a lot of times where I'll be, you know, critiquing some, some story where they deliberately mislead you so that they can get the slap at the end so that they can really, really shock you. But when you go back and look at it, you're like, there's no way that that detail exists within the world that I now know to exist. But in this, you go back through and you watch it all again and everything lines up. They never lie to you. And we also never see any scene until this one where we're with Michael that doesn't have one of the four major players in it. So we are always, so everybody is maintaining the fiction. There's no scene where, you know, somebody's talking is, I think the only thing we get is Michael talking with Janet, but Janet also, I think, doesn't know. I think she's not in on it. So he has to maintain the fiction for her because she has to interact with them. Yeah, I think I brought this up in mm-hmm. uh, a couple episodes ago in our spoiler zone yeah. that I thought that Michael was interacting with Janet alone at one point at the frozen yogurt shop, mm-hmm. but Jian Yu or Jason was right beside her. You just didn't see it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, because I th- I remember once or twice, like the major players in the scene being just Michael and Janet. But even then, I would let that pass because I think that Janet doesn't know. Yeah. And and because she has to be able to interact with these people, you know, as though this is exactly what what she knows and what she believes, you know. So, yeah. Right, because she has been stolen from a good place. Mm-hmm. So. so I find it really interesting. Mm-hmm. And in this private moment between Michael and Sean... Sean mentions retirement. Yeah. So it's likely that the retirement, the eternal shriek, as Michael called it, is actually real. Yeah. And yeah. describes very well what would happen to him if his plan failed. And their mm-hmm. their whole conversation is completely legitimate coming from both sides, whether it is a good place or whether it is the bad place. Mm-hmm. Their mm-hmm. conversation is completely true. And... Yeah. I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but when uh, when Sean says he is the all-knowing judge, it feels like he's saying it kind of like in a sarcastic way because that's the character that Michael's given to him. Mm-hmm. Because later on he says, and I'm wearing this stupid judge's outfit. Like, right. this is this is just, this isn't me. But That's not you know, who you... he is, right? Exactly. So, so I think that that might just be the character that Michael's given to him and he's mm-hmm. not actually the eternal judge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't think he's he just is, on the yeah. board, right? Yeah, he's he's looking at his robes. And he's like, I feel like a real wiener right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it is really like if you go back and look at all the details, it all lines up. Nothing. We we were they played fair with the audience the whole mm-hmm. way through. That is so hard to do. And I respect the hell out of it. Mm-hmm. We talked about this actually in an episode of our Burger of the Week where we we're discussing whether twists are lies and mm-hmm. a lie is not a twist. Yeah. So you can't have a show that does this big whole twist at the end and you rewatch it and see all these details that just don't make sense. Mm-hmm. Because you're being deliberately misled. So they're exactly. not playing fair with the audience. And this is playing completely fair. And I love it. Mm-hmm. That's why there's so many great movies with these massive twists at the end that are that hold up when you watch them again mm-hmm. because of, like, for example like the sixth sense one of the all-time classic twists oh, yeah. mm-hmm. you watch that again and you're looking for all these details that don't make sense you're like well i thought he talked to this person or that person but every single moment you're like no it's yeah. actually 100 percent true no it's this all is legit. great i was never lied to yeah and the movie doesn't say hey by the way bruce willis is totally not a ghost exactly <laughs> The, yeah, sh- that the movie a doesn't lie that's to a, the that's viewers. That's a big lie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> so I've got a little bit of philosophy to point out in this moment. Um, when Eleanor is saying her goodbyes to Chidi, and I'm just blubbering, um, <laughs> <laughs> she says, uh, I was dropped into a cave and you were my flashlight. And that line to me is too poignant not to be a deliberate reference to Plato's allegory of the cave. Now, are either of you familiar with that allegory? Yes. I don't think so. Um, Okay. So I will quickly summarize it. mm -hmm. So Plato tells us about people living in a dark cave in prison there since birth. The prisoners face a blank wall. They are chained and unable to turn their heads. And the only thing they see are shadows of people, objects, and animals passing by cast on the wall by a fire. 
And the shadows are all the prisoners ever see, so they come to understand them as reality. One day, a prisoner escapes and goes out into the daylight. At first, he's blinded by the sun, but gradually his eyes adjust and he sees the true form of all the shadowy objects. Plato wrote, Previously, he had been looking merely at phantoms. Now he is nearer to the true nature of being. The newly enlightened man returns to the cave to tell the other prisoners, but he has difficulty seeing in the dark cave now as he became used to the bright world. He tries to tell the prisoners about his discovery, and at first they are sarcastic, and then they get angry, and eventually they plot to kill him. So the allegory of the cave is meant to compare the effect of education and the lack of it on our nature. Uh Uh-huh. And to me, this relates to Eleanor and Chidi's relationship because Chidi was this giver of knowledge for her. Mm -hmm. It was like she was one of the prisoners and he came down and at first she was sarcastic, right? And she was angry that, no, that's not how the world works and I don't want to be this kind of person or I can't be this kind of person. But he Mm -hmm. manages to bring her out into that bright world of knowledge and understanding and Eleanor, at this moment, is kind of like another escaped prisoner. She realizes the reality that they live in, and she informs everybody else, and then informs all of us, the viewers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once we know, we can't see the world the same way. Mm -hmm. So when we're re-watching the show, we can't look at anything the same way, because we've been enlightened. Uh, Yeah, knowledge is essentially transformative. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering... If season two is going to kind of loosely follow that. That's exactly what I was thinking just now, actually, uh, that the narrative that you just spoke of basically mm-hmm. will be either Eleanor or somebody else, maybe somebody taking Eleanor's place in revealing what's going on, but mm-hmm. their eyes being opened to what's truly really going on slowly and trying to convince people. That's really going to be interesting. Yeah, because I think that like once you have knowledge, if you forget it, do you, does the transformation stick? Like, exactly. Eleanor came in, she was, you know, definitely in the cave. And I love that, that whole story. I think you have such a great insight there, Vivian. Um, and I think that, so she came in and she was, you know, in this dark place. Then she saw the light. She was essentially transformed. I mean, even when she was leaving to go, you know, to go away, to go to the bad place. And then, of course, to Minnie St. Clair, she brought the books with her. She took mm-hmm. the knowledge with her because once you have been transformed, you can't undo that. You can't unsee what you have seen. So when she forgets, You know, when at the end we pull this, you know, shadow over again, can you ever go back to being ignorant? Even though, like, you may not understand the specifics of it, there's essential knowledge that is within your soul that has opened up your soul. Does that go with you? Does that travel with you even into darkness? So that'll be a really interesting thing to see if Eleanor goes back to being, you know, her sarcastic, um, you know, cynical self, or if she is essentially transformed and even forgetting the specifics of that transformation, it still remains within her character. Exactly. And I think that's going to be another aspect of Michael underestimating humanity. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I really think that she has been fundamentally changed. Whether she remembers mm-hmm. it or not. That we're going to see it. I think so, too. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Now, honestly, I I got that reference after you mentioned you brought it up, you said, oh, the allegory of the cave. I'm like, oh, right, of course. But I don't think that Eleanor understands that. I don't think she gets that. I don't think mm-hmm. she knows that allegory. And I think that... You don't think Chidi told her about that at some point? I don't I think... mean, he had Plato on his chalkboard. I know, but point. I don't find it has much to do with his lessons as uh, Plato's other teachings. Okay. So I think Eleanor was just being blunt. Like, you guided me. You were my flashlight in a cave Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it just means so much more when you understand the reference Mm -hmm. yeah it's possible that eleanor wasn't making a reference Mm -hmm. but that the writers were yeah exactly when they wrote that oh i think so yeah Mm -hmm. for sure but it's such a beautiful line (laughs) it is is. makes you a little weepy i know i know okay (laughs) yeah it definitely does (laughs) it's very sweet now what do you guys think about eleanor's ethical math here She thinks that she should take the last spot in the bad place instead of Jason. 
And she comes to that conclusion because she says that Jason loves Janet and he's not taking anyone's spot. But if the real Eleanor goes and the fake Eleanor goes, then there's a vacancy in the good place, in my mind. Like, it just, her reasoning to me doesn't make sense. And I would probably say that Jason would deserve to go to the bad place more than she would. What do you guys think? I don't know. I think she's, I think she's looking at Jason has someone there who will miss him if he's gone. And I think that she is, I think that her, the goodness that she has, you know, kind of evolved into um, is looking at, you know, I mean, if you look at the overall, <laughs> you know, if you look at the overall good, right, the utilitarianism of it all, if she leaves, people are going to maybe miss her a little bit, but it's not going to be like breaking up a husband and a wife. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe she's looking at that and thinking that this does the least damage to everybody else. I think she is thinking about everybody else. What do you think, Jason? I think that Eleanor is trying to be very selfless at the moment. And Lon, you're absolutely right. I think she's protecting everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm just seeing it. No, it's it's you're you're both right. Um, and you both make really good points. Eleanor is trying to be selfless. She's trying to think of the overall good. I guess in my heart, it's just sort of like, well, Eleanor, you have grown so much more. You have earned your place here so much what, more than Jason has. And that's what makes her decision all the more meaningful and impactful because mm-hmm. she understands it. And mm-hmm. probably the reason why Jason could never make that decision, right? He hasn't grown enough right. to be a selfless person or to do selfless things. Right. I think that she's not looking at it from what what do I deserve because I've done all this work and I have, you know, grown and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think she's just looking at it as, you know, what what creates the least amount of pain and damage, you know? And I think that the, because Jason has a wife and because Jason has, you know, a future and a life and she knows that her soulmate isn't there, you know, as far as she knows. Right. Um, you know, I think that she's just looking at it from that perspective and, and truly being selfless. Cause there's a difference between wanting to appear selfless and actually being selfless, mm-hmm. actually, you know, thinking of other people first. Um, and she has taken all of these, you know, these lessons and internalize them to the point where this is where she naturally lands. It's not that she's like, I have to be a good person and I have to try, you know, this is, this is actually now who she is, who she really is. I love that you said there's a difference between being selfless and like looking like you're trying to be selfless, you know, trying to appear selfless. There's a huge difference. That's Tahani to a Mm -hmm. T. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's immediately what I thought of. (laughs) Mm hmm. All right, so we'll continue. As they argue, Eleanor has an epiphany. They can't be sent to the bad place because they're already there. Michael confirms this, and we flash back to him presenting his plan to a board of directors. The foursome and Michael discuss the events of their time in the afterlife, slowly uncovering the truth. So there's our big reveal. (laughs) How did you feel when you watched that for the first time? Oh, God, I was like, yes, of course. This can't be, you know, this is the bad place. For a minute there, I just sat there with my jaw open, like, Mm -hmm. oh, my God. But of course, once she says it, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like that moment in the sixth sense. You're like, of course, it was always the bad place. Look at how much these people, I mean, you know, Tahani is crying over Jianyu and she was couldn't understand why they weren't connecting. Um, everything has been just a constant series of, of trouble and pain. Chidi has been tormented this whole time over trying to make a decision. Stomach aches all the time. Um, you know, they have all been absolutely tormented and it's her ability to have that that insight in that moment is so great and as soon as she says it it's of course and i love that moment i love when that kind of revelation happens Mm -hmm. and you're like ah i get it i mean i'm not a big fan of like spoiler culture in general this whole idea that i can't know what color shoes she wears at the end because it'll spoil my understanding of the you know this is one of the rare situations in which i would say protect the spoiler (laughs) protect the thing people should absolutely get the experience of watching this extraordinary story unfold as it unfolds Mm -hmm. because it's so good now i was spoiled oh no so (laughs) i uh vivian watched this before she watched the show before i did 
Mm-hmm. And um, I had no interest in it. Mm-hmm. And I don't really remember why. But um, I guess I wasn't as attached to Kristen Bell as as she was. Um, mm-hmm. I enjoy Veronica Mars and all her other stuff. I think she's great. But I don't know. Something about it just turned me off until mm-hmm. I watched the episode. But I'm on Reddit all the time. And it was one of the top posts on the television subreddit and so of course i was interested and i because i wasn't watching Mm -hmm. the show so i'm like oh i'm not gonna watch it it's no big deal great spoiler awesome read it Mm -hmm. it's like oh that's really cool i respected it Mm -hmm. and then a couple weeks later i found out that i'm gonna be doing the show (laughs) (laughs) so found out like i just sprung it on you (laughs) exactly you say that like she took a pregnancy test and was like hey it's a podcast (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so unfortunately, I uh, I started the show. I mean, I busted through the show in one sitting. Um, mm-hmm. and I loved it, and yeah. I was, but I didn't get to watch it fresh, and oh, I, yeah. I I I forever kick myself for not <laughs> being able to see it because I love the reveal. I I watched that reveal over and over again, and I love oh, just yeah. Eleanor's holy mother forking shirt balls <laughs> and. <laughs> The cut to Michael, his yeah. s- slow transformation into oh, that a sinister laugh, laugh mm-hmm. and his grin, and just that whole scene I could watch over and over again. It's great. I love it. It is. It's just brilliant. I wasn't spoiled, thankfully. No, because you were watching it. <laughs> no, like, I was watching it pretty much live, yeah. Um, and a friend of mine, Garrett, actually was he watched it before and sent me a message and said, You need to watch it right now. <laughs> just don't do anything else watch it and i thought okay I mean, put down the phone all right i'll get to it eventually just like no 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 right now <laughs> don't even bother responding to me just watch it <laughs> exactly um i hadn't i was blown away because i wasn't really thinking too hard about the show while i was watching it i just sort of was casually enjoying it and i thought it was a fun premise and I really didn't think there would be this massive twist at the end. Yeah, you didn't think it would be that deep. No. <laughs> and that it would allow me to rewatch the show and see it from a completely different angle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really is a two for one experience because the first time you watch it, it's one experience. And the second time you watch it, it's a totally different experience and still fun and still funny. I'm still laughing at these jokes like out loud. I don't laugh out loud that often. Like I can appreciate that something's funny, but it takes a lot for me to like really laugh out loud. And I still have just joyous giggles when I watch this show, <laughs> even though I've seen it so many times. It is a very, very rare show. And you guys, I love that you how did you decide if you don't mind my asking like how pulling back the curtain a little bit here what made you decide to do a podcast about it pretty much the ending of the show mm-hmm. <laughs> once i saw the twist it was like oh i want to talk about this show i want to yeah. rewatch it and really dive deep into it well and then i took philosophy courses in university and i was always an interest of mine mm-hmm. and yeah. so i wanted to be able to dig deeper into that because i had always noticed all the books and everything that Chidi was writing on his chalkboard. And I just wanted to see, okay, how is that relevant to this episode? Mm -hmm. And where are we going with that? Because it can't just be random names of philosophers. And I just thought there's got to be something more to this. Mm -hmm. And there was. And I'm going to find it. (laughs) And I'm going to find it. I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to enlighten people. Yes. And you did. It's brilliant. I, I, I don't have a big background in philosophy. Like I, I know some basic stuff, but I never took a philosophy class. Like I never really engaged with it that much. Um, but I have some basic understanding and listening to your podcast has illuminated, you know, my basic understanding and really expanded it. And uh, so I'm really grateful that you guys decided to do this podcast. I think you're the perfect people to do it. You have such great insight on this story and you made it more enjoyable for me. And I loved it anyway. So thank you. (laughs) Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Personally, uh, we were doing Burger of the Week, our Bob's Mm -hmm. Burgers podcast. And I was doing that with Vivian because, you know, it's fun. Uh, We really like to just talk about just fun stuff because Mm -hmm. we love the show. And then to be able to do something a bit more deep with some more substance is intriguing and mm-hmm. a little scary because <laughs> I have no background in philosophy or English aside from 
my high school English courses and like one English course I took while taking graphic design, which like has <laughs> no relevance to graphic design, but whatever. You took an English class yeah, for graphic design? It was uh, mandatory. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. So it, it was it was intriguing and scary and exciting and, you know, all of the things that bring out my creative side. I was excited to try something new. Oh, that's wonderful. And sometimes the scariest things are the things that, that bring us the most value, you know, because if, if what you're doing is easy and it's in your comfort zone, then you're not doing anything new. You're not stretching yourself. You're not expanding what you're capable of and seeing what you can do. And it's always scary, you know, to kind of go into a new space. Um, but, uh, but I'm really glad that you guys, you know, had the courage to kind of step out in there because I think it was, it's just been fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm really enjoying it and kind of sad that the show is only 13 episodes long so far. <laughs> I know, but there's a lot of meat on that bone, though. Yes, I mean, exactly. they're like 20, 25 minutes, you know, and you guys are talking for each episode about an hour or so. It's awesome. I love it. And, you yeah. know, you're going to be able to come back next season. I mean, ordinarily, I get very wary of following a show as it's on because you're strapped to that show. And if it goes off a cliff, which happens a lot, mm -hmm. uh, then you're going with it, you know, and you're kind of there like okay so this week this episode sucked you know? <laughs> um, and it's never it's never fun to do that it's never fun to to you know have to be the one to be like well this stunk you know um, but I think that you guys are actually in one of the safer spaces for that because the the skill and um, attention to detail and care that this writing team has shown um, gives me all the faith in the world that they're going to do fantastic work all the way through to the end mm -hmm. yeah Agreed. me too Oh, yes. I had a question. What did you guys think of Michael's plan? Did you think it was a good idea? I think that his plan is essentially like the most inefficient plan I have ever seen. We're, we're employing like <laughs> 300 people just for the purpose of tormenting <laughs> four people. So you have to think like if you extrapolate that out and we have one bad place for every four bad people and 300, I don't know, immortal whatevers, I don't know what they are, angels, demons, whatever, um, you know, dedicating themselves to playing these roles to, to torment these people. I mean, I know that this is the first of its kind. So maybe, you know, I mean, maybe they don't usually do that, but it, it would seem to me that the cost benefit analysis here <laughs> has got I mean that is that is a ledger that is way in the red you oh, know, yeah. for, for what you're getting out of it at the same time I mean it is a really interesting idea and he is being bold and trying something new um, I just can't believe he got it past you know the the paper pushers I, I, I don't <laughs> understand how that ever happened but I guess like in the afterlife Things are different. You know, you have all the, literally all the time in the world. So you just kind of do your thing and, uh, and don't worry about, about how efficient it is. Um, but, uh, but I thought that that was the first thing that struck me was like, how in the world, you know, can, how is this sustainable? How do you have enough demons to handle this for like every four people? But I guess this in and of itself was simply an experimental thing, you know, that they would, they would make it more efficient as they went. They just wanted to see how it would work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's interesting and psychologically crunchy, you know, um, it's bold. I like that. Yeah. It's, there's something a little deeper than just physical pain torture mm -hmm. to like really break down the person mentally. That yeah. could be so much more rewarding for these types of beings. Mm hmm. I actually really love Michael's plan. I mean, it is completely inefficient having way too many people for just, you know, torturing four people. But I love it because he's gaslighting everyone. Mm -hmm. And that kind of torment is just, it lingers so much longer than physical torment, oh. I think. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And when you're put into the bad place and you know that it's a bad place, you just, you understand the world around you, right? You, you know, know you're going to be tortured. Your defenses are up. When mm -hmm. your defenses are down, that's when, and messing with somebody's head is like the worst thing that you can do to somebody, you know? Exactly. Um, it's pretty awful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love it so much because I think it's such a great new form of torture for them to explore. <laughs> Not that it's, uh, you know. It's a it's a sentence I never thought I'd hear you say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you gotta admire the dedication to the work. 
You know, it's about the work. It's about doing the job and doing it in the absolute best way that you can. And I think that's, you know, in and of itself, an admirable thing. Yeah, exactly. Even if your work is tortured, do the work well. Yeah. And if, (laughs) if, if, if you do the same thing over and over again, you're pouring spiders in somebody's eyeballs for the zillionth time, then that can get a little monotonous and... It gets Michael's old. plan. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You want to spice things up a little bit and provide some entertainment for the architects as well. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. like he said earlier, um, we never get to be there to see how fun it is. And taken out of context, yeah. we think like how fun it is in the good place. Yay, except it's the bad place. So <laughs> how fun it is for us, the architects, torturing yeah. people. Like we get to see it firsthand. That's exciting. We have never get to do mm-hmm. that. So it creates a a whole new aspect of their work. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the architects are just generally never in one of the places. Mm -hmm. So the good place architects are never in the good place and the bad place architects are never in the bad place. Mm -hmm. They just create it Mm -hmm. and then let things run themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Must be hard not to see the product of your work. Yeah, Yeah. I think it would be. I Mm -hmm. think it would be. It's a really interesting piece of world building. Mm -hmm. It really is. Do you think that the reasoning behind sending Tahani to the bad place is correct? Like, do you agree? No. <laughs> Not at all. You're such a Tahani defender. Well, it's no. just so surprising because you. No, I remember him I watching know. the show and being like, oh, Tahani. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's so condescending. She's the, she's the worst. I love to hate her. But I, what she did is, let's just look at it bluntly. She raised, you know, $60 billion dollars for charities and all that just because her intentions were not correct it doesn't negate all the the good that that money did right but i mean you know intentions do matter though don't they i mean doesn't it doesn't it matter she didn't raise that money for other people she raised it for herself and she bought her own narcissism with it so i mean i don't know like tahani i think is you know, she's she's deceiving herself. She is, yeah. Like, people who, people who do these things in full knowledge of what they're doing, um, and ju- they just don't care. Like, that's worse than somebody who, who does it without realizing it, who's, whose insecurity is so strong, you know, and so inescapable that even as they're, they're working desperately to kind of fill that void, um, you know, the fact that she did good, that she chose something that was good, that did, a, you know, a, a consequential good, mm-hmm. you know, to fill that void um, is just an accident. It's a happenstance. <laughs> like, it, I don't think it really counts toward her. But at the same time, she didn't deliberately hurt anybody. She wasn't mean to people. She was, you know, name dropping and doing things that might make other people feel somewhat lesser, but not to make them feel lesser. It was just mm-hmm. to, to prop her up. And she is also the result of, you know, some really, really, you know, class A bad parenting, like people Mm -hmm. were those people were terrible to her. And when you look back at somebody's childhood, and you see that they were the odds were stacked against them, and then judge them because they didn't overcome those odds, because they weren't strong enough, and they didn't have enough insight, you know, Um, not to mention the fact that and here's one of the big things is that all of these people were like embryos when they died, you know, they're like in their 30s, you know, that's Mm -hmm. very, very young, (laughs) to die and it doesn't give you much of a chance to gain the kind of wisdom and understanding that you would need so i don't really see any of them as being bad enough to be in the bad place and the people who are good by these standards to be in the good place i'd kind of rather hang out in the bad place with these guys you know you got to think about the company you keep when you choose heaven that's all i'm saying it's not good um so I don't know, like, I I think that Tahani doesn't deserve to go to the bad place any more than anybody else does. I don't think she's any worse or any better than any of the rest of them. Their point system is very strict. And very flawed. Yeah. Very flawed. And, and a little random. A little eating a sandwich gets you good points. I mean, you know. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> it depends on the sandwich, too. I mean, some of those are just bad news. <laughs> well, what about Cheaty? Do you guys feel like Chidi deserves it? No. Chidi's a good guy. 
He's a good guy who can't make a decision. And yes, the, his inability to make a decision, you know, can be annoying to the people around him, but it didn't like kill anyone. It didn't hurt anyone. And he never, ever deliberately hurt anyone. There's no reason why Cheedy should be in a bad place. There is, I mean, unless they have some kind of revelation about him that, you know, that, that shows us something darker. I mean, he out of all of them is like the best. I mean, he did grow almonds and use almond milk in his coffee. He used almond yeah. milk, even though, yeah, exactly. And the fact that that even makes his radar of bad <laughs> things shows me that this is not a bad guy. You know, this is he has done the least amount of damage. He has annoyed people. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but if annoying people means you're going to hell, then I am on the straight A express bus already. So <laughs> I don't really think that that's, you know, it just it doesn't it doesn't wash for me. That mm -hmm. was like one of the weakest parts of of this, I think, for me, was the idea that, like, if Cheaties go into the bad place, who's in the good? There are There is no good place. Oh. And that would be interesting to see if there is actually not if really a good no place. good place. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm I don't know. We've never seen it, so. But to me, it seems like proportionality matters. So if you're really rich, like Tahani, and you throw big parties to raise money for charity, well, you've done a good deed, but it wasn't a big sacrifice to you. Like, you didn't give a lot of yourself. But if you're poor and you offer your food to someone in need, then you've given so much of yourself. It costs this... you a lot more. Exactly. Yes. In this act of mm -hmm. charity, right? So right. it kind of depends on your position in life, too. Well, then we get into relativism. You mm -hmm. know, it's all it's all relative. It all depends on where you are and and who you are and why you're doing it and whether intention matters. I mean, all of these questions are questions that people have been asking for, I don't know, since the beginning of human existence. <laughs> exactly. You know, what is it that makes a good person? I mean, that's not a simple question and there is no simple answer to it. Um But uh, but I mean, I find it really interesting that the the measure by which someone is defined as good and bad is so wholly out of whack with basic essential, you know, morals. Just, just what is it that makes like, if you, if you're trying to do something bad, if you're deliberately trying to hurt people, if you're deliberately doing things regardless of whether or not they hurt people, which I think you can point to Eleanor, you know, that she did a lot of things and she just didn't care. She mm -hmm. didn't care who would hurt. She is probably out of all of them, the worst as far as how she treated people, how she spoke to people, yeah. uh, how she used people. Um, you know, Jason was dumb. Yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's just impulsive. Right. He just doesn't know any better, you know, and I think that that gives him a little bit of a pass. Um, Jason, I would say, is next worst next to Eleanor and then Tahani and then Chidi, you know, but I mean... They're, they're, none of them are, are all that bad. And the fact that Eleanor can, you know, with this, this guidance, find her goodness, find the goodness within her, which is there. You know, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a, a really good thing. And it speaks to the essential, you know, growth of human beings that, that even after death, they don't stop changing. They don't stop growing. And, Death feels like in this particular model of existence, a very arbitrary point at which to say, well, that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no hope for you. You're done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the beginning of the episode, in the extended version, we have a conversation between Dave and Michael. Uh, Dave's, uh, Michael says, you have an appointment with the director of point calculations where Dave says, oh, let's reschedule that. These things take like a thousand years. Mm -hmm. But the fact that there is a director of point calculations makes me think that the point system is not set in stone. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. uh, It can be modified, changed, adapted, adjusted, etc., etc., etc. And maybe the point system that we that Michael's been telling everybody about is completely bogus. Oh, it may well be. It may well be, you know, cause it's like, uh, you know, sticking with the Cleveland Browns gets you points, you know, I mean, it's so mm -hmm. random. And then we've got all these, you know, like these 
pop culture references that didn't exist. So obviously it must be a changeable system because we have to be able to add in these new references, mm -hmm. you know, and then decide what the, uh, what the value is, you know, um, of that, of that action. Um, so it is, it's kind of like the world building, once you dive into it, becomes ever more complex when you start asking <laughs> these questions. You know? Yeah, which is great. I love it. Mm -hmm. Michael reveals that he will erase their memories and start over again, this time spreading Tahani, Michael, Chidi, and Eleanor apart. Eleanor scrambles for a plan while Michael asks for Sean's approval. Eleanor writes a note and sticks it in Janet's mouth right before Michael erases their memories. The screen turns white and Eleanor is once again waking up to her afterlife. This time, her soulmate is an ex-mailman named Chris. Janet gives Eleanor the note, which says, Eleanor, find Chidi. Come on. Oh, man. Come on. Okay, so this is the final twist <laughs> of this episode, on. and I love it. I love it to death because... No, 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 no. <laughs> I had no idea where they were going to go with this. And I thought, okay, well, now they know. Yeah. So now what? Now what are we going to do? Right. Are we going to have an entire season of them kind of battling... Are we just going to have a few episodes of that and then somehow things will go back? I just didn't know where they were going to go with it. And then when Michael says so plainly, so simply, like, okay, well, I'll just try again. Yeah, I'll just erase your memories. Yeah. No big deal. I was shocked. Wait, whoa, wait. Oh, yeah. You could totally do that. Yeah. And I'm just so intrigued to see where they're going to go with this in season two. And I love seeing all the little differences in this new The Good Place 2.0 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. where you've got pizza places instead of yogurt shops and i just i just think it's so fantastic it's gonna so, be so fun to find all those details yeah, yeah. they're great whatever blah 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 <laughs> let's go back <laughs> let's take a few steps back and eleanor writes a note to herself okay now let me just i've got i'm gonna play both parts of this because eleanor all you have to write is eleanor this is the bad place done okay but if she Okay, all right, you keep going, you <laughs> whoa, keep going. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then I thought, Eleanor, you're so dumb. Like, why wouldn't you just write that? Just tell yourself the truth. But then I thought of the cave allegory again. Oh. Mm -hmm. And you can't just be shown the truth immediately. Like, someone tells you the truth. That's a big truth, like a huge mm -hmm. truth. Something mm -hmm. as big as you are in hell instead of heaven. You need to be led into it. You need to slowly walk into the outside world and your eyes have to adjust to the brightness. Mm -hmm. And Eleanor needs to slowly adjust. She needs to find Chidi. They need to rekindle their relationship. They need to chat. They need to bring up those feelings that are still in her that were just erased so she doesn't remember them. But that's, I think, why it's important that she writes find Chidi instead of this is the bad place. Oh, absolutely. I think you're completely right there. I think that because what she's going to do in the last few seconds before she loses everything is she's going to focus on the most important thing. And what is the most important thing that you have a piece of knowledge or that the, the person who can enlighten you, you know, is that, that you're going right. to find that person because having a little bit of knowledge about the bad place, that this is the bad place tells her that. But it doesn't get her reconnected with the most important thing, which is Chidi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if she just tells herself this is a bad place, then she doesn't get that relationship right. again. What she wants isn't the knowledge. What she wants is the relationship. Aww. Yeah. That is and the relationship sweet. will lead her to the knowledge. So there she gets both. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's sweet. I'm I'm wondering <laughs> where Tahani and Jason are going to line up in that. Oh, Because gosh. Jason knows that he doesn't belong there, but now... Unless they do something different, because he might not, like Michael might not tell Jason, oh, you're supposed to be Jianyu and all this kind of stuff. He might not give him that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that could go in a very different direction this yeah. season. I'm yeah, interested no, to see be. if they're going to stick with the Buddhist monk story or if they're going to go somewhere else and maybe make it so that... Oh, if Jason Mendoza, you've died and you're now in the good place. And or Jason's you were pretty just awesome. So yeah, right. Because, because Stupid if, that he thinks he does belong. Well, yeah, if Michael tells him he was awesome and he did great things on Earth and he made so many people better, Jason would believe him. Oh, yeah, he would totally believe that. Yeah, I was awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to see us do something fun with uh, with Manny Jacinto because he is... 
He yeah. is so good. Like uh, Jason is not that interesting a character. Um, Very one dimensional for sure. Right. But when we have these, these moments that are, that are out of place, when we have these, you know, these inconsistent moments, as much as they, they worry me, you know, I think, I think it means something more, but I'm not sure. Um, when he delivers that line on consequentialism, God, you can see like there's so much more under the surface with this actor. I think mm-hmm. that there's so much more that he can do and I want them to make him do it. I really do. So I don't care. I don't care. I will take whatever excuse they have to do something more with him, but I want to see it. Me too. He who smelt it killed Janet. I'm sorry, but I just can't like, <laughs> I, I love him so much. And one of the things too that I would love to talk to you guys about is the real Eleanor or AKA Vicky. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what yep. did you guys think of her? When I rewatch the show, I think that she's laying it on real thick. Mm-hmm. Um, Super thick. <laughs> but I do admire her efforts. And I love that twist. I mm-hmm. love that twist. Oh, so I great. love it. I hated her the first time because she was mm-hmm. so good. And I'm like, oh, my God, you make me want to vomit. I hate you. Um, she good. annoyed me. She annoyed me more than Tahani. When in the end she comes in and he's like, the jig is up, Vicky. And she's like, damn it. You know, and she goes. Through. That was when I was like, I love her. And I've always liked that actress. I've seen her in a few things and I have always really enjoyed her. I think she's good, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, man, I love I love her as Vicky. I hated her as Eleanor. I hated mm-hmm. that. Um, but I loved her. I love her as Vicky. And now when I watch it again, and I know that she is really underneath it all, like a bad, bad demon person. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. To have someone who's good with no flaws is just boring. Oh, God. It's just I a know. poorly written character. Yeah, right? really. So mm-hmm. I, I like rewatching it. But yeah, definitely the first time I was like, oh, she's yeah. too good. She's just, too perfect. I love that whole scene where there's... Michael's throwing in all these possibilities on their the way he can get out of the situation before Eleanor figures it out. Like mm-hmm. her coming in saying, Oh, I'm gonna go and or now you only have to find one. And then Bamba John comes in and Eleanor's like, Buzz <laughs> off, Bamba John. We got this and all these little things that Michael's trying to throw last ditch efforts to mm-hmm. keep them from figuring it all out yeah it's really fun to see michael and sean scramble Mm -hmm. yeah those moments Mm -hmm. i think that it's a great idea that eleanor wrote fine cheaty because if she wrote something like this is actually the bad place or this is hell then she might have gone to michael with it Mm -hmm. because at this point oh she doesn't know cheaty right like she doesn't have anyone that she can trust and the only person she spent any real time with and that she's building a bond with is, is Michael. Michael. She doesn't even mm-hmm. know Janet. She, yeah. Because she's yeah. super surprised when Janet pops out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And her new soulmate is so focused on getting jacked or whatever that <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even have a moment to to talk to her, right? So, But he's the hot mailman, though. I loved that, yeah. too, because we had that mailman thread running mm-hmm. through the whole thing. I didn't even see mm-hmm. it. My youngest daughter was the one who pointed it out to me. And then, I, and then after that, of course, you can't unsee it, you know. Of course. Yeah. Um, but it was so brilliant the way they just kept hitting that mailman very subtly, and then mm-hmm. she has this hot mailman. You know, it's it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, I would have, I think, if they had written something different, I would have seen too many possibilities of how this could go wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas if she just says, "Find Cheaty," it's like, okay, just just find him. That's it. Right. Just get to know him. Start well, she that relationship know what again. Cheaty is. Well, no, but she'll figure it out. Yeah, she'll figure it out. She'll figure it out. Figure yeah, it he'll out, be but... the one reading a book of philosophy in the middle of the lake, not knowing how to get back to shore. <laughs> how do to I row? <laughs> I love that. I feel bad that Janet has been rebooted for uh-huh. the second time now, mm-hmm. um, because I wonder what the future is for her as a character and for her and Jason, like... Will they fall in love again in season two? Will she develop that personhood? Because if she's just a blank slate, like if she's just, you know, Janet, Mm -hmm. but nothing more. Well, from what we've been told is that Janet builds on every iteration of Janet Mm -hmm. builds on her, the previous one's knowledge. So perhaps she will grow even more because she's already started to. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
And, it, you know, it comes down to that, that thing between the, the divide between the soul and the brain. You know, like mm -hmm. the brain can be rebooted. The brain can be washed. But the soul right. has knowledge and memory, you know. Exactly. Eleanor is being rebooted. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we said that Eleanor is likely fundamentally changed by her experience. Exactly. So right. it so stands it's... to reason that Janet would be as well. Mm -hmm. I think Janet will be. Yeah. I think we're going to see that. Mm, I'm excited. <laughs> So we got some feedback from listeners, and I just want to go over some of this and get your your comments on them. Alan, the host of Shadows and Shamblers on American Gods podcast, he wrote us an email and he said that the world building of the show is so interesting to me. The good place and the bad place are so polarized and extreme. This is in line with modern Christianity, but otherwise is so inhumane that it hardly shows up in other religions. Usually there are levels in the afterlife. Dante wrote about different levels of hell becoming worse and worse. And on the other side of the coin, a heaven, like a seventh heaven, is uh, layered in almost every religion. And so the only, only the most pious could get into the best heaven, but most people can get into the lowest one. So he brought up this, this idea, and I think that would be interesting if we explored something like that, like having different levels of the bad place or different levels of the good place and a that maybe michael is using yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah and maybe michael is using that seventh heaven idea of the the top tier heaven mm -hmm. as the good place model where yeah. you can only get in if you have you know a million good points mm -hmm. right but it does seem like we have a very stark it's either the complete heaven or the total torment exactly. you know mm -hmm. and there is no as they've constantly said there is no medium place you know there is no no spectrum in there it is simply you know one or the other it is black or it is white and that is it you know and uh, and the starkness of that worldview i find you know kind of kind of interesting and it, it lacks uh layers and complication and nuance that i would like to see and i'm hoping that we uh we get a sense of you know of more complication within the world building from from what we've seen this season and i think we're going to mm -hmm. have to get that i think they're going to have to layer that world building maybe it's random maybe you randomly end up somewhere and you know because there's nobody like and and honestly the better people that I know, they're always worried that they're awful. You know, they're always worried that they're not good enough, that they're not doing mm. enough, that they're not being good enough. And then the, the terrible people that I know, like the truly terrible people that I know, feel really good about themselves. So I think that, <laughs> like, I think that people who are genuinely good are concerned about being good and, and worry that they're not doing enough. So you could convince a genuinely good person, like, say, I don't know, cheaty. <laughs> You know, that he's in the bad place for good reason. Mm -hmm. He'd be like, oh, okay, you know, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the almonds, you know, I mean, the, exactly that kind <laughs> yeah. of thing, right? You're worried about the almonds, you know? Um, so I think that that the idea that, uh, you know, what I see in the world building is that it is, there is no good place. There is no bad place. You just landed randomly in, with these terrible demons who are tormenting you just for the pure fun of it. Like that it that has nothing to do with any kind of consequence of how you lived your life. Um, hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that could be a possibility too. That's scary to think about. Mm -hmm. It is scary to think about. Yeah. Alan also talked about purgatory, which is, of course, something that we've uh, we've thought about. And I'm sure a lot of people have thought about while they're watching the show. And he was saying, in, you suffer in purgatory, but your suffering improves your spirit and makes you a better person. Mm -hmm. So maybe in season two, we'll find out that Michael doesn't understand his job and people are actually being purified some way. Like... <gasps> the place that they're actually going is a purgatory to become better people. And if yeah. you don't become a better person, then you can go down to have, uh, you can go down to the bad place. Mm -hmm. And this place, just this purgatory gives you the opportunity to grow and become better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really interesting. That's very close to my theory. My theory is that Michael doesn't know everything either. Mm -hmm. that, that, I'd there like that are, idea. There are greater layers going on. And I think that, um, I think that that's going to be kind of an interesting thing to see, you know, to see what, what other people don't know. Cause mm -hmm. there's so much that we didn't know in the beginning, you know, and then we learn more and we learn more and we learn more. And I think that those, you know, un unraveling the layers of that is going to continue. And we're going to find out that, that not everybody knows as much as they think they know. Mm -hmm. Now you briefly mentioned, um, the medium place. 
do you believe that that is a construct of Michael or do you believe that this medium place actually exists? The Mindy St. Clair place? Yes. Oh, interesting. Um, Because does Mindy St. Clair work for Michael, basically? Oh, God, that's an interesting idea. I don't know. I don't know that I have a strong theory about that because I think you can go either way. Janet is defying Michael by taking them there. Mm -hmm. And she knows about it. Which would make me think that if Janet is not in on the scam and she knows about this place and this Mindy St. Clair, then it is outside of Michael's architecture. It is outside Mm -hmm. of Michael's control and Michael's world. So I would think that. But it's entirely possible. I mean, I think there are probably arguments to be made that she is actually an extension of of Michael's architecture. Where do you guys come down on that? I think that she's real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that the medium place is real. Yeah. Um, I don't think that Mindy actually has anything to do with it, um, which I think is fascinating. And I know death of the author, but Michael yeah. Schur did say in an interview that the medium place and that Mindy were all real. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was after I thought about that myself. And I was kind of happy to see that in his eyes, I was right. But yeah, yeah I just don't see how it really works for Michael. Because, well, unless Eleanor had planned to stay there for a while with Jason, but then that's kind of removing them from the Mm -hmm. torture of the four of them, right? Yeah. It'll be interesting. I'm I'm very confident that we'll see a return of Mindy. Mm -hmm. On the Good Place subreddit, a user named Wise Blood Fool Heart said, uh, What if you don't belong here? Note that Eleanor wrote or that Eleanor saw at the beginning of the show was actually herself sending a message to herself. And that this cycle that we've seen was not the first cycle of her waking up and realizing that they're in the bad place. And what if this is, you know, the nth number of times that this has actually happened. And I know there's lots of evidence. The handwriting doesn't match up and, um, that's basically the only evidence that we see. Well, Jason but... would have to be in on it because Jason said he wrote those notes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that, I love that idea of, we think it's the first time this has happened, Eleanor waking up in the yeah. afterlife, etc. But finding out that this has happened many times before just gives me goosebumps. I love that idea of being yeah. completely bamboozled. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this makes me think of, like, it's, it's probably why you love the movie, uh, the name I can't think of right now, Memory something? Memento. Memento, Memento. okay. Oh, right. Yeah, it's probably why you love the movie Memento so much, just finding out all kinds of things about, oh, has this happened before, or uh. are we doing this again? Mm-hmm. Um, now, you said that the only evidence was that Jason said he wrote the note, and the handwriting doesn't match up. But we also have a conversation with Michael and Sean in this episode where he's saying, you know, when you came up with this idea, you thought that this would last a thousand years. And we kind of get the idea that this is the first time that Mm -hmm. he's doing it. But I like that there's a possibility of next season doing something like that, where maybe we're going to see Eleanor's memory get erased a few times. Mm Mm-hmm. That would be so interesting. There's so mm-hmm. many places to go with this. And we can't do the same show over again. With like just subtle differences. Yeah. No, we, mm-hmm. we can't. I mean, mm-hmm. some people would say, oh, I'd love that. But you, you wouldn't love it after, you know, 13 episodes of doing the same thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have a game changer. Like these people know what they're doing. You know, they ha- we have a solid game changer for the end of the season. I think they're going to keep doing that. I think they're going to keep expanding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the show continuously has done that mm-hmm. you think the show is going to be about Eleanor trying to fake her way through the good place and then suddenly there's another person who doesn't belong there mm-hmm. and it, it just they keep on throwing wrenches in the gears and it's great yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it is another yeah. thing I'm wondering about season two is are they going to continue to have flashbacks because we've already grown to understand what kind of people they were on earth we know who Tahani was, who Eleanor mm-hmm. was. So are they going to keep showing us flashbacks of their time on Earth to kind of give us a little bit more? The only thing we're missing is Tahani's death. Yes. 
We don't know yeah. how she died, mm-hmm. which bugs me. I want to know. Like, Didn't she say she gave her life to save other people or something like that? I mean, she, we said mm-hmm. something about that, but we didn't yeah, get any details she, on it. She said she moved a nation or made mm-hmm. a sacrifice that... That changed the... Um, <clears throat> yeah, that changed a nation somehow. But mm-hmm. I wonder if we're going to see a flashback of her just kind of like saving someone from getting hit by a car mm-hmm. or if it's going to be something where she really thinks it's this big sacrifice, but when we look at it, it's not. It's not, yeah. <laughs> or it's something where she became a joke. You know, like one of those Darwin Award th- oh, people, yeah. you know, who die and become okay. a, a tragic cautionary tale for everybody else. Yeah. Um, that could be kind of interesting. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. that does change consciousness. You see somebody die really stupid and you're like, okay, no forks in the toaster. I get it. I got it. You know, that changes <laughs> the world, right? Um, okay. We pretty much covered... What they asked in their emails, actually. I just looked over that. So I think we're good for that. Okay. Uh, Lonnie, did you have anything you wanted to ask us before we sort of start wrapping up? No, I think I'm good. I think I've asked you all of my questions that I had. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. So that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like our show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. You can find Lonnie on Twitter at Lonnie Diane Rich or at Chipperish and her excellent podcasts at Chipperish.com. And you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and use the hashtag FBullshirt. Or you could find us on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And as always, you can visit our website, multiverseradio.ca. Now, Jason is not on Twitter. Oh hashtag get Jason on Twitter. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, but you can follow me, Vivian, at Slayers, comma, the... And that's comma written C-O-M-M-A. So we're considering reviewing some movies that center on the afterlife during our hiatus, but we will be taking the month of July off. And new episodes are scheduled, uh, new episodes of The Good Place are scheduled to return in the fall. So follow us on Twitter or Facebook to get updates on our schedule. And I'm thinking maybe we should organize some kind of live tweets for season two. That's a possibility. Oh, that'd be yeah, fantastic. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. Yes. Although we don't have cable, so... Yeah, well, I'm hoping that we can somehow get screeners, because <laughs> unfortunately we can't get them through NBC, because they're not Canadian, I guess, but we might be able to get some episodes early. Or we could do live tweets the next day if some people are willing to wait a day. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, people Maybe. can watch on their DVRs. You know, I've got a little yeah. uh, a little HD, like, you know, plastic square that I tape to my window when I have to watch something live. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, because uh, I cut the cord a long time ago. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you could definitely, you could do a whole bunch of different things. Because it'll be on Hulu the next day. So that can give you a little more flexibility. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that would be, that would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put all the information um, for Lonnie's podcast in our show notes, as well as a side-by-side comparison uh, images of the first time Eleanor comes into The Good Place and the second time, because <laughs> uh, it's interesting just to notice the subtle differences in decor and the looks on their faces. Mm-hmm. And as well, I'm going to put uh, a few videos that kind of explore Plato's allegory of the cave in our show notes. <laughs> Oh, you know what I didn't get? I just realized I didn't get from you. What are your theories? For season two? For season two. Yeah. I didn't find out what your theories were. For season two, um, it's tough to theorize. It's fun to. um, Mm -hmm. But I believe that we are going to see more of Tahani and Chidi and Jason interact. Mm Mm-hmm. Because we haven't really, we didn't really get a whole lot of the four of them or those three separately along, um, without Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm I'm predicting that we are going to see multiple memory erasures and a lot more of Michael's boss. Oh, okay. And his work environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really want to. I really want to say that we're going to find out how this has been done before and we've gone through so many iterations of this this quote unquote good place even though I don't think it's going to happen but that's okay <laughs> I could it dream could be interesting it could be interesting what do you think Vivian my thoughts are pretty much the same i think that we're going to focus less on eleanor this time around because we focus so much on her in the first mm-hmm. season i hate to say that because love kristen bell 
but mm-hmm. I also love her with everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. As part and of the I ensemble. Think, mm-hmm. Exactly. I think we're going to have probably like a couple, maybe only one or two episodes of just this new place and getting to know it again mm-hmm. um, and seeing it through that different lens. But I think it's going to be pretty quick that we find out what this really is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they can make it last for too long. And I think that we're going to get a lot more of Michael and the behind the scenes stuff, mm-hmm. I which I think so. is going to be a lot of fun. A lot more world building and yeah. hopefully lots more Trevor because Adam Scott is fantastic. <gasps> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I know. I love him. <laughs> I love him and Bad Janet. The rest of them Bad I can live without. Ugh, love Bad Janet. I know. Darcy Carden is amazing. Yes. Mm-hmm. The rest of them are just kind of hands to hold cell phones, really. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. basically. Well, my theory is that Michael is doesn't know as much as he thinks he knows. Mm-hmm. That we're going to get him to a point where he needs them to remember in order to get out of whatever trouble he's in. Uh, so that they're going to end up working together against the rest of them. That he's going to like end up on their team at some point during the second season. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I really like that idea. I hope that happens. I always we'll love villains changing sides. But oh, at the I same time, that. him, like, at the same time, Michael still being really frustrated with the four of them because they were his undoing. Mm-hmm. But oh, yeah. needing them, like needing yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He needs them. Like, he hates them, but he mm-hmm. needs them. They are the only ones who can save him from whatever trouble he ends up in because this whole thing went south. We keep holding this threat of retirement over him, mm-hmm. you know, and the eternal shriek or whatever that was, right? <laughs> so I think that we have we have a sword of Damocles that's hanging over his head. And if that thing starts to fall and he needs these four in order to get out of it then we end up having this you know this team of people working together with internal antagonism within the team but then a a common enemy external to that i think that would be really interesting i would love to see them do that Mm -hmm. that's that's what i want (laughs) that's really what i want for this show she said and i just (laughs) i want to keep being surprised by the show too so i'm very open to just being along for the ride and allowing myself to be surprised at the twists and turns that are bound to happen. I don't have any doubts that the writers are going to give us some incredible stories that oh, yeah. will make yeah. us laugh and be shocked and surprised. And yeah, and I we'll, just, yeah. One thing that's important for me for watching a show that has a big twist like this is to not expect it all the time. Mm-hmm. Like once you, once a twist happens, And then you start thinking, oh, I wonder what the next twist is going to be. And that can kind of ruin things. Well, especially if you're so invested in predicting it. You know, like, I'm going to predict what's going to happen. I'm going to know because I'm going to know ahead of time and prove that I'm smarter than these writers. I think Mm -hmm. that the most fun is like what I love about this is that I feel so safe with this team of writers, I feel like I can depend on them to give Mm -hmm. me something interesting. And so I'm happy to just let that happen. I mean, I would love I'm just saying what I would love to see. But I have no idea what they're actually going to do. And I will bet whatever it is, it's going to be unbelievably awesome. And we're going to keep probably doing hour long podcasts next year, too. (laughs) That'll be awesome. I'm looking forward to listening to it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so great to have you on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I love talking about this show, and I'm so glad that you guys invited me on. And thank you so much, listeners, for tuning in every week with us and listening to us talking about philosophy and all kinds of great stuff. Sending us emails. Yes. Thank you for all your feedback. And we want to hear your theories for season two as well. Yeah. So send us the information. We've already provided you with the contact stuff, so you know what to do with it. (laughs) <laughs> thank you very Shout much Lonnie <laughs> thank you so much for having me on the show it was really really fun and I hope you'll have me back next time oh absolutely next season so. yeah yeah okay <laughs> all right thank you so much take care okay bye, bye. there we go <laughs> oh, oh wow. that's perfect <laughs> so cute <laughs> she's a little meower <laughs> <laughs>